as you press on, you notice that the stars above you have not moved. Uh, it, it almost feels like no time has passed. Like it's just going to be night forever while you're in here. Except for this, the, the red star. It still glows and throbs in the heavens like an open wound. So you're understandably on edge given everything you've been through as you continue to make your way through the corridor. Uh, at one point in time, uh, Cetrani jumps when he hears a sound, but it turns out to be nothing. Uh, another time, Rex steps on an ancient bone that, that shatters like a shot. But eventually you make your way through and you eventually come up to a set of large bronze doors that are open. They, they, they're wide open for you and you can easily step inside. Uh, but even before you step inside, you can see that the room beyond is some kind of strange art gallery. You can see there are tapestries and mirrors and paintings on the wall that look like they were all made yesterday. Uh, in the center of the room, there are uh, busts and statues. But everything depicted looks like they are figures that are twisted and distorted in pain. Uh, everything looks like it's it's the celebration of or the capturing of some kind of moment of exquisite agony. Do you step into the art museum? Yes. Yes. Uh, you step inside, and as soon as you do, the lights actually come up. You notice that there are torches in the wall, and they just burst into flame as you walk in. And you all are nervous and ready, weapons drawn, but nothing seems to come out of the shadows. And there are small mirrors along the, the corners and edges of the ceiling that are redirecting the torchlight and actually causing it to come down on certain of the paintings and the statues, almost like a, a light shown from above to draw attention to certain pieces. And most of the pieces you really do not want to examine in any kind of close detail. They're, they're, they're horrific. Uh, but in particular, on the wall to your left, there is a giant mirror with gold edging. And the way the light sparkles and flashes off of it draws your eye. And I need you to each make a wisdom saving throw. Difficulty 15. It is a trap if you have trap sense. 15. 15 uh, before I add my wisdom, so that would be 18. 9. You have two fortune left. Oh, maybe I'll use a fortune this time. 20. Uh, so all of you look and you see the three of you standing there. And then you watch as Rex actually becomes smaller and younger. And you can see not only the age that prematurely came upon him before disappear, but also uh, years of height and muscle fade to where uh, Rex in the mirror looks like just a scrawny puppy. Uh, Sister Mutt, on the other hand, uh, seems to be turning older you can see the gray encroaching into her fur and her back is starting to bend uh, and, and Satriani just disappears uh, one moment he's there and it looks like his face is changing slightly although whether becoming older or younger it's hard to tell and then he's just gone and then you could feel a tug on your mind and all three of you pull your, your view away at the last moment oh don't look at the spooky mirror. Uh, I look down and I look around at this place of horrors and I just say I don't like any of this. I wouldn't even steal it if you paid me. As you look away, you see that across the art gallery is another set of those large bronze doors. Uh, and these burst open suddenly, as soon as you pull away from the mirror. The strangest thing happens. A figure runs through the door, but they're running backwards. Uh, their form is obscured by a cloak that seems to be just made of rainbow light. The thing runs backwards into the room and it's gibbering in some kind of 
bizarre tongue, kind of similar to the tongue of the, the gibbering you heard earlier. They turn to look at you and, and, and the it, you can see a bit of a nose, but otherwise the face is just wash in rainbow color. And then it, it screams and pulls out a long sword and lunges at you. I need everyone to roll initiative. So this is going to be a dexterity roll. Um, and then whoever has the highest starts the round and we'll iterate from there. 17. Well, that beats my five, so. Three. With no dexterity modifier, I got a natural 20. <laughs> so I, I guess Sister Mike goes first. This thing is pulling on the long sword and clearly has ill intent. I'll, I'll whack it with my base. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's keep it simple. I, hit, I rolled a five. You're very disoriented with the, the mir- strangeness happening in the mirror, and so when you swing your mace, it's, it just completely misses. It doesn't even impact with the, the thing in front of you. Who goes next? Rex, let's, let's go. All right. I'm going to step in front of the little papillon and make sure he is safe. <laughs> you know what? I've got one thing, and I'm very good at it. I'm going to uh, hack this thing into pieces with a great sword. I mean, it's 17 on the die. It's going to hit. 17, yes. That would definitely hit. Um, so your sword reaches down, or starts to slash down. Roll your damage. That's eight points of damage. You hear a, you hear a grunt of pain, um, but it, it's odd. Um, normally, when you hear a, a grunt, it's like an oof, so there's kind of like that explosion at the end. It almost seems like it's it's different. Like it's a like it's like the, the pain that you're being sucked in. It, it's a strange moment, uh, but you don't let that disorient you you definitely have drawn some blood on this thing a um, little bit little flecks of blood are starting to drip off your blade even though you can't really see it on the creature who goes next i'm gonna have the creature go next creature puts a paw towards its chest um looks confused or what you can tell the face but the body language seems very kind of confused uh and then it mutters something again and then its paw glows and a burst of energy shoots out and hits Rex in the chest for 23. Huh, yes, that will hit. And it's five points of radiant damage as your body almost feels like it's erupting in fire. He's a big man, but he's not that proud. He howls. Sister Mutt, you can make a no religion roll right now using your intelligence. 22. Do you recognize this spell? It is a holy flame spell. It is practiced by the shepherds of man. Anyway, on to Satriani. I let out a low growl, seeing one of my friends hurt, duck behind a statue, load up my crossbow, and say, Leave my friend alone, you fiend! Roll again, natural one. Oh no, you have one fortune left. Or, if you keep the natural one, you will generate a point of fortune for the party, but you will obviously fail miserably. I am a team player, so I will keep that natural one. So you um, pull the, the crossbow out and... You go for surely going to be the best eye shot of the evening. And then you hear that heart-wrenching sound of your bowstring snapping and slapping you across the muzzle, taking one point of damage. Ow! But it is the top of the round, and you can go again as long as it doesn't involve using your crossbow. I think I would like Sister Buster to go first, perhaps using their knowledge to help us out. So, in theory, if you cast Spare the Dying on a dead person, what does that do? Um, that is an interesting question. Would you like to find out? <laughs> yeah, it, it requires me touching this, this undead thing, but uh, let's find out. So, first of all, you have to make a, a dex roll to try and touch them. Uh, 14. Uh, that is not enough. The, um glowing of the robe, it actually makes it hard to figure out where the person is in relation to your paw, so you actually end up passing through uh, thin air. So who goes next? Uh, the, the glowing creature, Papillon, or Rex? Hearing my bow strap snap, I let out a growl, and I dart out with my dagger instead, trying to strike at this being on the side. Maybe even trying to flank him a little. Go ahead and make a roll. If you succeed in your attack, um, I'll give you a chance to hide afterwards because you're choosing a strange angle to approach. That is a 18, 20, 22. That is definitely enough to hit. Five damage. You feel your dagger, there's purchase. So there's 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 there's, there's meat, there's something under there. It comes away with, with blood. So it's not like these, these ancient corpses. This is 
some kind of creature. And because of the strange light of it and, and how you danced around, uh, you actually find a small bit of shadow behind one of the, sh- the statues. So uh, next round, you'll be able to attack with advantage because you're, you're hiding. Mm. And with that, I'll let the creature go next. Okay. Uh, the creature spins around. It pulls out a long sword, and Rich is going to try to attack the creature that stabbed it, but now you're gone. So, you know, the papillon has disappeared. So, instead, uh, it roars again. It's got a strange, weird, modulated sounds, and it ends up slashing at Sister Mutt, and fails. Uh, the sword whistles through the air, several inches away. Uh, maybe the creature is, is somehow just as disoriented as the rest of you. It's clearly unable to hit, or maybe your magical spells are protecting it from this potentially evil creature. Rex doesn't know any of this interesting stuff about it, so he, I'm just gonna belt it again. Oh, no. No, I'm not. That's a four. No, sorry, it's a five. You do have two fortune. I'm not wasting a fortune on this. You uh, slid your sword forward, and actually, um, you, it's a palpable hit, but um, you can feel your sword kind of skating off of some kind of, of mail, probably a, a scale or plate. Maybe it's under the, the cloak. So you hit, it's just the armor actually deflected your blade. Uh, but we're at the start of the next round, so you can decide who goes next. I'm going to pass it back to Sister Buster, please. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to touch to see if the spell will actually work in hurting it, or I'm just going to get blasted. We'll spare the dying, we'll do what it does to an undead. Um, it's dexterity roll. I'm going to give you advantage this time, because now you're, over the course of the fight, um, your companions have kind of spread out and encircled the creature. So now it's... N- it's, it's, it's trying to keep all of you in view at once, um, which makes it a little easier while it's disoriented to maybe try to get in and touch it. All right, 15? Still not enough. It's very hard to see through, unless you want to spend a fortune. What do you think, guys? Go on. Go on. I want to see what this does. All right, uh, natural 20. The good news is that uh, you unerringly managed to look through the, the rainbow colors and, and plant your paw firmly on the chest of the creature uh, in front of you. You can feel there's metal armor underneath your paw. So so underneath this strange light, there there's an armored form, something that's a touch of the mundane. Uh, and so you spare the dying, and you can feel your energies of your spell take hold. The bad news is, is that they don't seem to latch on to anything. Uh, the, this... this creature is not dying nor is it dead and so therefore your spell dissipates that does give you information which means this creature is not undead nor is it dead uh but that said another thing you notice as you're going to pull your your paw away is the way the light uh comes off of your paw as you pull it out there's a weird ripple uh when you put your paw on the on the hand, it's almost like you couldn't see your paw. Like the paw disappeared. Like your paw just vanished. You pull it back and there's a strange ripple. And it reminds you of an artifact of man you read about once called the chameleon cloak. That actually turns people invisible. This is clearly not invisible. Something is wrong with this artifact. But it reminds you of that. Who goes next? Uh, I don't really want the creature to go next. So uh, we'll pass it back to our dear Papillon. Hmm. Well, keeping up momentum, I will once again dart out with my dagger, trying to do a little dance with this fee and saying, Come on, Rex, you've just got to hit it right in the head. That'll do it. Oh, is that all? Exactly. Go ahead and uh, make your roll to advantage because you're not hiding, and I'm going to give you a fortune for banter. Ten. You just got a fortune. You want to spend it? Sure. I'm getting so many rolls today. So many rolls today. Come on. It's the exact same roll. You really rolled a ten again? Yes, I did. So um, you're, you're slashing your, your dagger um, down and um, you, you, you feel a ripping uh, uh, and it's, it's not flesh, unfortunately, but it, it feels almost like it's plastic, which is odd. Like, like a thin plastic sheet that you can, that you're ripping with your, your dagger before you pull your dagger away. And I dart behind another statue just saying, oh gosh, darn it, stop moving. Uh, you can make another dex roll to see if you can hide again. Let's be a stealth roll. Fifteen. Uh, so you're hiding again. 
Uh, and then you could choose either Rex or the creature to go. Rex. Just hit it right in the head, Saturini. Just right in the head. Yes, I mean, I'm shorter than you. It's harder for me. That is the second nat 20 of the night. Is that right in the head? So you swing your sword at you, like, both anger and at the fight and also really annoyed at Papillon right now. Uh, so you swing your sword down, gritting your teeth as you scream, and you hear a solid chunk. Um, and two things happen. First, the body slumps to the ground. And second, the rainbow light fades. And you can see that it's just a dog in a cloak. The hood's pulled up over their face. The dog in a plastic cloak. Oh. And it opens one of its paws. And a symbol of the Church of Man falls to the ground. Oh, no. And then you look down and you pull back the hood. And it is Marion's face. It's not alive, nor is it dead. It's something else. It's her. It's her face. But it's not a living or dead. It's not Marion. I sneak forward and I look over the body and I give it a little poke with my dagger. S- sister's right. It, it, it can't be. We, we've, we've buried our friend. This isn't our friend. And Why would she attack us? And where did she get this strange uh, cloak? And I try and tug at the, the weird bit of plastic. As you tug at it, um, rainbow colors kind of flicker and fade through the weave of the plastic. So the, the rainbow light was actually coming from the plastic itself. But now it's the light's ebbs in and fades out like like whatever magic is in it has been drained out of it is she dead or just dying she is dead and as you stare in horror at, at what looks to be but cannot be your friends you hear a voice coming from the doors that she ran through all you hear is one word and uh mm, I lean down to grab the holy symbol frowning a little you look at it and it is, you've, you've seen her wear the symbol before it feels warm in your paw a comforting warmth uh, but it has that little nick at the top right where the cord goes you remember that she got that when she tried to hide it really quick when you were discovered by the guard dogs and it ended up actually scraping against the edge of your dagger as she tried to stash it away This is definitely her symbol. I let out a little snort and say to the others, someone is doing something very unpleasant here and trying to be very, very cruel. I don't like it. I say we... It's her, Saturini, it's her. There was something in the journal, right? There was was something in the journal about how she died, wasn't there? Let's, Let's deal with this person saying enter first, because they might know, and I don't think I like them. I think this is a trick. Um, because when I tried to use the, um, spell on them, I determined it wasn't, this, whatever this is, was not alive or dead. Exactly. And Sister Buster would know. No, this is magic. We need to go through the door. This was a test. I don't know if we passed. Fine. Fine. I kneel down next to the body and I just murmur to her. I'll come back for you. I'll take you home. And, uh... I am very angry now because I do not like people who hide the truth or fiddle with it. And someone definitely is trying to trick us or hide something here. So I just stalk forwards very quickly. Not even waiting for Rex, you just stomp right into the room. No. When you step in, you're the first person to see that this room is... Gigantic. I've been using language how, how, to express how big this is. This room would be big even for a normal structure. Uh, you can see the walls in the distance. And you both recognize that they are stone walls, but also feel like they're so far away they almost become geography. Uh, the room is bathed in the red light from this strange star. In the center of the room is a massive chair. It can only be called a throne. 
it is made of metal and there are almost like snakes or ropes of plastic leading off of it in hundreds of different directions. Some of them are even plugged into the occupants of the throne, which you can see is a massive creature. It has skin that is gray as old mud. Uh, it has a trunk rolling off of its nose. It has two arms on the arms of the throne, two arms raised to the sky and his two legs onto the ground. And you can see that there are massive ivory tusks hanging out of its mouth that are almost serrated because of all of the engravings and whoops and whirls that are carved into the bone. And its eyes, its eyes are deep pools of black staring at you. And it feels both infinitely wise and utterly alien. And the trunk ripples and vibrates as you hear, Good, you have come. Do the other two step in? Yeah, I think Rex is the last one in this time. Uh, it, it's, it's real. I knew you would come. I knew you would be here. Is, it, is this the buster? Is, is this the elephant? Is that what it is? Yes, I am. <sighs> I see. Well, explain yourself, sir. What have you done to our friend? What What is the meaning of this of these these horrible creatures and and this strange walls and and and, and our friend just back there who who you pretended to, you you made a fake version of them? You who study and worship humanity demand of me. Yes. I don't care who you are. You've done terrible things. I am the Oliphant. I know everything. Then tell us what's happening here. Where are we? You are in my domain, in my tower. Why are the stars wrong? Why is everything backwards? When I was born, when I was created, I was cursed. The old ones looked to me and said, An Oerlifant always remembers. An Oerlifant must remember. And so I did. I remembered everything. I remembered when humanity left. I remember what they did to you, the dogs, and the cats, and the rats, and the mice. And then I learned everything. How to exist, how to live, how to build this, how to shape time and space itself. And I can never forget. And I can never forgive. And then one day, a dog came to me. That day, yesterday, it was tomorrow. It is now, it is never. And that dog came to me and said she wanted to know what happened to the humans. And so I did to her what they did to me. I punished her and made her go back through her own timeline into the very thing she feared, death at the hands of those closest to her. And now three dogs have come. They came yesterday. They came tomorrow. They came now. And now it is time to punish you. You 
will see your future. And then from around the throne, this lumbering monstrosity shambles forward. It has six arms, six legs, three heads. One head is a papillon. And one head is a mutt. And one head is a Pyrenees. Roll initiative. 20. All right, 16. And six. Okay. Mm. So I think it was Saturini goes first, yes? I growl in anger. For yes, this thing is scary, and yes, this place is terrifying, but this thing has admitted it itself. It is the reason our friend is dead. It did something to make us kill our friend, and now it's killing us as well. This is a villain of the greatest caliber, and not only that, but it presumes in its language and its ways to be a king, to be a lord, just like every lord and noble I've tried to take down in my life. So no, this being is going down in the name of our friend and in the name of all the good people of Pugmire, even if I have no idea how. But before this hideous beast appeared, there was something I wanted to try first, and that's what I'll try and do on my first go. I look at the tubes attached to this thing. I want to aim my crossbow bolt at one of those. A wonderful, inspiring, heroic act, but you've already forgotten about the crossbow that snapped. Luckily, I carry a spare? You can make a wisdom saving throw to see if you carry a spare string. Difficulty is 15. Five. You have one fortune left. You can try one more time. No, 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 no. This is dangerous. In that case, seeing, reaching into my pack, remembering that the crossbow bolt is done, well, then I need to try and go for it with my dagger. I'm going to get my dagger out and I just start running in the direction of one of these tubes. I'm going to try and, if I can, leap up at one. No one is expecting this, I think it's fair to say. It's like, uh, it's, it, it, as far as I ever can tell, you have just lost your mind and started like, hacking at plastic tubes. Uh, the tubes aren't moving and it's a giant uh, a throne, so I'm going to say you could just hack away at a couple of tubes. Um, as you do, lightning pours out of them. Uh, uh, it, it's 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 strange. You hack through, and then there's a a smell, almost like of blood, and then lightning shoots out of of one of them and arcs off into the sky, and then falls dead to the ground. And you hear a high pitched noise at the edge of your hearing, but you couldn't quite. It, it's back. It's 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 come, and it's it's almost. Rhythmic? There's almost a, a, a steady thrum, if you, for what you can tell. So, and it's, it happened immediately when you slashed one of those tubes. Uh, you're gonna keep doing that then? But I guess it's the end of my turn. Yes, but who goes next? Rex. I'm staring at that oil event. I, I seem to have forgotten that I even have a sword in my hand. And I look it straight in the Pyrenees' face. I've, I've seen my future and it looks just like my past messing up hurting people who need me and I can take it punish me and let them go make a charisma roll mm, it's a 13 the Pyrenees head says something back to you but it's that strange language which you're now starting to realize is actually talking backwards. So you got a reaction, but you don't know what that reaction was. Who goes next? Sister Buster. This is quite a situation. Indeed. Um, I have one that's soul-searching, and the other is slashing at plastic tubes. And you know what? I think smashing plastic tubes sounds like a really good idea right now because that seems to be uh, something that isn't fighting back even with the lightning and the noise and the smells um, perhaps if we destroy enough of these priceless plastic tubes whatever is happening will stop 
and a mace is really good at that. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow Papillon's example and smash some plastic. So same thing happens. Um, you, you bring your mace down and um, you, you, you start to, to rip these things off with, with the thrust down your mace and, and more lightning shoots out of it. And that you're starting to hear that sounds now too. There's a kind of a, a strange thrumming sounds just 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 off sign and then the, your nose is full of strange and, and arcane smells that, that are trying to overwhelm you but all you can think about is smashing these things in front of you who goes next the giants or the olifants i guess letting the giant go might might be better than the olifant uh so the giant steps forward and it brings down a heavy claw and it starts to smash down on Rex Pyrenees. And then right above the head, the fist stops and the Pyrenees head starts to bite the Papillon head. We'll now go to the Oliphant, who still sitting in its chair and you can hear it, 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 it's, it's breathing. You can hear it's breathing. It's so loud like it's right in your ear and then in the breathing you hear what are you doing and it does a thing you cannot see uh, but it is top of the round and the olifant decides to go next and so now it's going to activate a thing that it activated earlier Satrini um, could you make a wisdom saving throw It is. this is considered to be a trap Nine. one fortune left or do you want to just eat it? I could eat it. The plastic tubes you're cutting apart start to come alive in your paw, and lightning comes out of the chair as it actually draws the thing back in to reconnect to the chair. Almost like your slashing has been undone. Unfortunately, you're standing between it and the chair. And so you take five points of lightning damage. I yowl in pain as I fall back from the chair, burned badly by these electrical bolts. I will let Rex go next. Still looking between the giant and the elephant. Still holding his ground. There's no need for this. You're not angry at them. Did you make another charisma roll? That's looking better. That is uh, 15 on the dice, so 16. The Papillon head, which has been bitten and screaming, snarls and says something backwards to the Pyrenees head. And the giant steps back. Who goes next? Hmm, I think the good sister again. The question I would ask Sister Mutt is, does she believe the Oliphant is evil? I think that punishing someone for seeking knowledge and then twisting their the circumstances to be killed by people that they love is an evil act. Uh, so if this Oliphant was was created by man and is the sacred beast, it has been twisted in such a way that it is no longer serving that purpose. Um, so I do feel that it is evil. Um, at this point in time. If I can cast protection from evil on everyone, that would be great. So um, one of the rules of Pugmire is that uh, in addition to rerolling dice, uh, it hasn't really come up until now, so I mentioned it before, but you can also spend the fortune, you have one fortune left, to cast a spell, uh, any spell you have. Um, and uh, you can also cast spells for a slightly better than usual effect. So it's, it's the big blowout spell at the end of a battle or whatnot. Um, if you would like, you could spend your last fortune to try to cast Protection from Evil over an area. Either your three friends, because you're still relatively close together, you can cast it over the giants, or you can cast it over the throne. Okay, we will try to cast Protection from Evil on the giant and hope we have a new friend. Okay, you now have no more fortune. You start to chance the spell... And it's taking longer than usual just because you, this is a much bigger spell. You're basically modifying the spell on the fly, effectively. 
And in the back of your head, uh, a small part of your brain realizes that maybe the chanting you heard when you fought earlier with Marion may have been her casting her spell backwards. Uh, a bit of a regret that you'll tuck away and deal with if you survive this experience. As your paws go out and you intone to the, the mercy of humanity, a bubble appears around the giant. And the mutt head starts to mutter something backwards. And then it's speaking forwards and says, Whew, finally. Who goes next? Okay, giant friend. Let, let's, let's, let's see what you do now. The giant looks at you. The Papillon head smiles and the Pyrenees head nods and says, We'll fix this. And it turns and slashes at the oily font, ripping those plastic cords away from it. Lightning arcs into the air as the creature screams and says, I will send all of you away. And it puts its its hands out and then you're gone. And you're in Pugmire. And it's raining. Because it always rains at funerals. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played Tower of the Oliphant for Onyx Path Publishing's Realms of Pugmire. You will find the new edition of Realms of Pugmire live on Kickstarter by following the link in the show notes. Joining Craig for the series was Eddie Webb, Kat Evans, and Kim Godwin. The music was made by Agar Sonus and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. We'd like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon. Martin Hoyshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Bob Lange, Julian, Cameron, Xavier, and Anton for their generous support. And we'd of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Infinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember to always be a good dog.